Welcome back to Nysora YouTube channel. In this video, I will discuss an article that was just published in the New England Journal of Medicine. The article is titled Spinal Anesthesia or General Anesthesia for Hip Surgery in Older Adults. The article reports the results of the study that compared the outcomes of the spinal versus general anesthesia after hip fracture surgery. But the reason why I wanted to discuss this article is because this article has a potential to create a confusion and bias against spinal anesthesia among both medical care providers, patients, and healthcare administrators. To begin with, the title of the study is misleading, as it says that the study is on the outcomes of the spinal versus general in adult patients having any hip surgery. It's only when you read a paper that it turns out that the study involved only patients with hip fracture. Now, this is no small difference, as patients with elective hip surgery are typically healthy, whereas patients with hip fracture are much older and present with multiple comorbidities that are a constant threat to life. Now, this is a statistically sound study, but with clinically irrelevant results. As a testimony to my concerns of misinterpretation, the article was brought to our attention by one of our surgical colleagues who said, and here you see that spinal anesthesia is no better than general for hip surgery. The study found that spinal anesthesia was not superior to general with respect to the risk of death or new inability to walk independently within 60 days. The authors of the paper then go on to recommend that based on their findings of the similar outcome, whether you receive spinal or general anesthesia for hip fracture repair, you will have the same outcome. Therefore, the patients should choose the anesthesia technique based on their preference rather than anticipated differences in clinical outcome. Really? Would anyone with clinical experience in providing anesthesia and postoperative care of these patients ever expect a life or death outcome between such short anesthesia interventions? Or would anyone tell their patients that anesthesia choice does not matter? I don't think so. In preparation for this Nesora YouTube video literature review, I talked to a number of regional anesthesia experts, surgeons, and some of the authors of the study that I know. Some even admitted that their centers refused to participate in a study because they felt that the primary outcome variables, a composite death or new inability to walk three meters in 60 days, were simply irrelevant, irrealistic. Moreover, they worried that the participation in the study would deprive the patients, sick patients, of the well-known advantages of the spinal anesthesia and regional analgesia protocols, which are the standard of care in many institutions worldwide for patients with hip fractures. He's one of the world's best known hip surgeons, heads to say. Hello, I'm Christoph Korten. I am a hip surgeon, um, adult reconstructive uh, surgery of the hip. I work in the hip unit of the orthopedic department of Siekenhuis Ost Limburg in uh, Genk, Belgium. The study will definitely not change our practice. And as a matter of fact, it confirms the fact that with um, local regional anesthesia, we're doing the right thing. Of course, as long as this Spinal anesthesia and local regional anesthesia is standard of care and used in the same way by all the anesthesiologists as is done in our department and in our hospital. The outcome difference of spinal anesthesia versus general anesthesia is obvious to all clinicians who use spinal anesthesia in these patients in their practice. But the quality of the recovery and complications cannot be measured by survival or inability to walk at 60 days. Even in this publication, the authors did find a lower incidence of death, pneumonia, and critical care admissions in patients who received spinal anesthesia. Unfortunately, by methodological choice and the design, they did not comment on this as they selected to study only the extreme, unrealistic micro-primary outcomes. The very same authors in the earlier much larger observational study did find the spinal anesthesia significantly reduced the risk of death and pulmonary complications by almost 30%, exactly the same findings as in this study. When I asked a few of the key opinion leaders in regional anesthesia and co-authors of the study if these results published in the New England Journal of Medicine would change their practice, the answer was unanimous, no.
spinal anesthesia will remain the anesthetic of choice in their practice. However, my concern is that this paper may be misinterpreted by the orthopedic surgeons and even anesthesiology practitioners and patients who may not be familiar with the regional anesthesia. Regardless, I do want to make sure that my critique of this paper is not misunderstood as a disrespect to the authors and their massive efforts that invested. In fact, this study is a good example of what can be done when you have a large sample size. We should assume that the New England Journal of Medicine statistical reviewers assured absence of statistical flows. Although the authors do appear to break some design and analysis rules, they are very transparent about these and they justify their statistical adjustments. But the recommendations that the authors suggest that the patients should make their choice between spinal and general anesthesia based on their preference and not on the anticipated outcomes because they did not find a difference in outcome does not really make sense. Patients are not that informed, particularly in the acute situation. So let's see how that could look like. Perhaps something like, sir, would you like a needle in the back or would you prefer to go to sleep? as you have the same chance of dying or inability to walk at 60 days or developing a delirium, whichever technique you get, clearly this would be a gross misinterpretation of both spinal and general anesthesia. And in the acute distress, such as during hip fracture, we must be patient's advocate and suggest the best option. Several large studies have clearly documented that when you take all cameras for hip fracture, lower extremity joint surgery in particular, spinal anesthesia reduces complications. The findings of every study should always be interpreted under the conditions of their methodology. So let us briefly review these conditions in this study. I will only highlight my major concerns. The concern number one, the study was powered assuming that the primary outcome, which is composite death at 60 days, would occur in 34% of patients in the general group which makes sense given that these patients have very high in-hospital and upon discharge mortality. However, this outcome in this study occurred only in half of these patients, meaning that the patient population was much healthier than expected or much healthier than you normally see in clinical practice with hip fracture patients. And since the healthier the population, the smaller the differences between anesthesia choices, it may not be surprised that they found no difference in these crude outcomes. Concern number two, the spinal anesthesia protocol in this study mandated intraoperative administration of sedatives during spinal anesthesia. However, sedation in the elderly is well recognized risk factor from confusion and delirium postoperatively. Basically, mandating intraoperative sedation by methodological design may have contributed to the lack of difference in the incidence of delirium, which was their secondary outcome. Concern number three, the trial does not specify how our patients made comfortable for positioning for spinal anesthesia. In other words, patients with hip fracture who receive spinal anesthesia must be positioned for anesthesia in the lateral or sitting position. But because they are in so much pain, it is not possible to do so without some kind of a pre-medication or analgesia. But pre-medication and the methods of analgesia were not specified in a methodology. So it's possible that the patients who received spinal anesthesia in this study received a large amount of sedatives, opioids, ketamine, or even a short general anesthetic just for the spinal anesthesia. Therefore, I'm not sure that we're studying two different things. As an example, in our practice, we routinely administer fascia iliaca block supraingnally, often as early as the patient comes in the emergency department. And only then, when they are pain-free after the block, we position them in a lateral position for spinal with minimal pre-medication. The goal is here to avoid massive sedation and administration of the medication or even brief general anesthesia, which many people do. This can cause delirium. In one of the institutions I visited, I witnessed a staff using 100 milligrams of ketamine intravenously for positioning for spinal, which is basically a general anesthetic that will cause delirium in everyone. Concern number four, 
as many as 15% of patients randomized in this study to receive spinal anesthesia crossed over to the general anesthesia because of the technique difficulties and inability to administer the spinal. Therefore, it is very likely that the spinal procedures were often attempted or done by practitioners without sufficient expertise with spinal anesthesia. This is not a radical statement. We train residents from major universities throughout the world, and it's very common that they come to the rotation with us at the CA2 or CA3 level as competent generalists, but they may not have done any spinal anesthetics at all. So the regional anesthesia skills are not taught and they are not ubiquitous as the general anesthesia skills are. For all of these reasons, I believe that this trial was really biased against spinal anesthesia. Therefore, the readers must also do their part in deciding whether the authors have met the burden of supporting the study conclusions and whether these conclusions are relevant to your practice. Hello, my name is Sam van Bokstaal. I'm an anesthetist and emergency physician at Zol Genk. Uh, we have a large uh, hip surgery service. And after reading this interesting article in the New England Journal of Medicine, I don't think it will uh, change in any way our practice that we do have at this point, which is a fascia iliaca block and a spinal anesthesia for patients having a hip fracture. And this really goes to my D state for p-values. People think that once the p-values have spoken, it's a done deal. But this should really not be the case. The inclusion bias of healthy population, the mandatory intraoperative sedation as part of the methodology, the lack of standardization and information of the pre-medication for positioning for the spinal anesthesia, and the apparent lack of the research staff with regional anesthesia expertise in this study are problematic. So what does this study tell us? Well, the study tells us that if you take 1,600 patients that are healthier than a typical hip fracture population and you randomize them to receive general anesthesia or non-standardized spinal anesthesia where the expertise may not be available for spinal anesthesia, resulting in 15% of patients crossing over to general anesthesia. And if you mandate intraoperative sedation for spinal, and you don't know what the methods are used to accomplish analgesia for positioning for the spinal, then there is a 95% chance that you will not see a difference in composite death or new inability to walk three meters in 60 days or delirium. The correct recommendations rather should be something along like, under the conditions of our study, we did not find differences in onset of delirium, composite death, or new inability to walk at 60 days. However, readers are encouraged to self-interpret the results regarding in-hospital pulmonary complications, critical care admissions, and death in this and other large observational studies when making recommendations between spinal and general anesthesia for patients with acute hip fracture. In my opinion, in three decades of experience providing care to the orthopedic patients, Spinal anesthesia is the method of choice for most patients with hip fracture where expertise for regional anesthesia is available. Thank you for watching and make sure you subscribe and hit the notification button so you never miss our upcoming videos. And make sure that you visit Nesora NLS, the Nesora's regional anesthesia learning system where you can learn or teach everything about regional anesthesia.